Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This podcast is brought to you by hituni.com. That's hituni.com. HitUni is an e-learning course provider specializing in high-intensity training for personal trainers and for people looking to learn how to apply the principles of HIT to their own training for best results. It comes highly recommended by Body by Science author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, MedEx Precision Fitness owner Blair Wilson, HIT expert Drew Bay, and the founder of Living La Vida Low Carb, Jimmy Moore. It was founded by author and high-intensity training master personal trainer Simon Shawcross. Simon has 15 years' experience and has supervised over 15,000 workouts. Due to a combination of demand and a lack of quality in certification programs in the fields of high-intensity training, Simon and his team spent the last three years developing top-quality courses that will educate fitness professionals and participants to enable them to train individuals and themselves in the safest manner and produce best results. Hit Uni has been put together using knowledge from the very best minds in the field of exercise, including Skylar Tanner, James Steele, Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, John Little, Mike Menser, Arthur Jones, Dr. Ellington Darden, and many more. The courses are delivered online through the website, where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace and convenience. The online video presentations are engaging and make learning fun. Online support and a discussion forum are provided to resolve any sticking points and enable you to share ideas and ask for help. Depending on whether you want to become a personal trainer or already a personal trainer who wants to upskill, or if you're a keen HIT participant that is eager to learn more about how you can apply HIT to your own workouts for maximum benefit, there are several great value courses to choose from. I am personally partway through the PT course and I'm really enjoying it. I primarily wanted to do the course to learn more about how to apply HIT to my own training for better results. The courses are really easy to follow and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I.com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10, So again, head on over to hituni.com, H-I-T-U-N-I.com, pick your course and enter the coupon code CW10. Thanks very much for your support. Hi guys, this is Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, where it is my job to interview world-class experts on exercise, health, performance and business and productivity to identify the mindsets, the workouts, routines, habits, diets, philosophies, books, and resources that you can use to significantly improve your effectiveness and efficiency in your everyday life. Guests include exercise scientists, successful fitness CEOs, world-class experts in biomechanics, vagabonding entrepreneurs, New York Times best-selling authors, elite adventure racers, and much, much more. Today's guest is a senior lecturer and course leader in fitness and personal training at Southampton Solent University, James Fisher. James is well known for contributing a large volume of scientific literature to the resistance exercise domain over recent years and is right up there with the top scientists around the world exploring how we can get the most uh, in terms of positive adaptations from strength training and exercise in general. Um, I enjoyed my first conversation with James so much. He's been on the show before that I asked him to come on again to talk a little bit more about exercise. Uh, And in this podcast, we talk about engines of our lives, Muscle Training 2015, uh, which some of you might recognize as a talk James was part of in Dresden uh, recently, uh, alongside Dr. Doug McGuff and James Steele, um, where James lectured about uh, advanced strength training techniques. Um, Following this presentation, there are a lot of questions on the internet, um, primarily on the, the bodybyscience.net blog. Um, and what I've done is I've taken some of those questions that I thought were most poignant and I've asked James those in this interview. Um, so we talk a lot about grip strength and the Pareto law principle towards resistance exercise, um, the upsides and downsides of abbreviated two-way and three-way split routines. So we get pretty technical, but it's all good stuff. 
Uh, I ask a few questions that you guys submitted. Um, you know, there tends to be a large focus on hypertrophy in this podcast. And whilst that is typically what I'm most interested in, uh, there are obviously many other positive outcomes from resistance training. So we talk about how it improves things like joint, ligament and tendon health. Um, both James and I are huge basketball fans. Um, so uh, we do get into, we do talk about basketball a fair bit uh, regarding Kobe, the end of Kobe's legacy um, and actually the the mileage and wear and tear that professional athletes go through is something that we, we talk for some length on. A um, couple bonus questions. Uh, we do talk about things like uh, the health hacks that James employs. So, you know, I'm always interested in, you know, what are the little tiny things that some of these experts do that, um, you know, they feel gives them the edge or, or helps them improve some aspects of their health. So we get into a bit of that. Um, this one's more like a conversation. It's not, you know, I... I generally ask questions and sit back and be quiet, um, which I think every good interview should do. But in this one, I do talk a little bit more. Hopefully, that's not annoying for you. Um, Because actually, I feel like we really do have a good conversation uh, and we talk about some quite cool and and different stuff in this one. But um, please let me know what you think. If you want me to shut the hell up in the future, uh, please let me know. (laughs) But without uh, further ado, please enjoy this great conversation with James Fisher. All right, so correct me now. Are you a PhD yet or are you almost a PhD? No, it's kind of still in progress. It's, the problem is I'm doing it by published work, so it's uh, the publications are already out there. People have probably read them by now, but I haven't tied it all together yet with a nice little bow and presented it to a PhD <laughs> committee yet. So, okay. not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's left for you to do then? When you, you know, because I saw, I saw that you. It was interesting. Your I can't remember the name of the paper now, but it looked like you were looking at um, resistance training in young adults. Oh, you, you have to remind me the title now of the the paper. Um, is that the yeah. final paper you're working on? Uh, the final one I was looking at was the to failure versus not to failure. Oh. Um, and, and to be honest, the way a PhD by published works goes is that you just kind of pluck whichever ones tied together the, the, the easiest and then write a narrative that ties it all together and discusses how these variables sort of work. Um, so I am in the process of doing that. My uh, director of studies is a Professor Mary Neville, who's a pretty pretty big name in, in exercise science in the UK, but not so much in resistance training. Um, and I'll meet with her in the new year and decide when, when I actually present this to a committee. So uh, it, it could be you know, sort of March time, or we could decide way down the line and just give me more time to not focus on it and procrastinate. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Because it, it appears to me as if you're you're doing the work of and have been for years uh, a PhD. You're you're teaching a very high level, and you're teaching a lots of different disciplines within exercise. And it's just, it, it, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's really just about getting those letters. Yeah, it, it really is. It's it's something of a formality, and mm. it's very much something that I want to, to to achieve for my own for my own personal benefit. But also, I think there's a credence attached to it. Um, there's, there's a credibility that people look for. Um, but yeah, I mean, fundamentally, a PhD is a research degree, and if you're already publishing research, a lot of people have turned around to me and said, "Why bother? You're already doing the research." Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah. a, it's a funny one. It's a funny one. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, and it's um, it will just get you. You know, unfortunately, it, it just gets you. A, unfortunately, or fortunately, it will get you a lot of respect from the layman just by having those those letters on the end of your name, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Which is another biases, I and mean, we were talking about biases earlier, weren't we? I don't know which yeah. one that that falls under, but. Um, uh, cool. Okay, so uh, you did an awesome talk recently in Dresden. I was watching yours and and Doug's. I haven't watched James Steele's yet. I need to to watch that. And that would that conference was called Engines of Our Lives Muscle Training in 2015, I think, or part of the conference. Um, you talked about advanced strength training techniques, and there was a lot of stuff actually in on Body by Science dot uh, net uh, Doug's blog. Um, with a lot of comments about your um, your speech and the context of hypertrophy. So what I've done is I've pulled a lot of the questions I've created. I've kind of been inspired by that 
uh, by, by those comments left on the blog. Uh, and a lot of this I know is going to tread over old ground that we probably went over last time we spoke. Um, yeah. So hopefully you won't be too tired of answering some of these questions. Um, but anyway, so starting with the first one, I, I sort of pulled out uh, and something I was thinking about was, yeah, so if you're doing like a big compound exercise, like a, a, a lap pull down, let's say, um, is it difficult to take all of the muscle groups, especially those larger muscle groups, to failure due to having potential weaknesses such as, i.e., grip? Um, so therefore, will there be a situation where actually it might be more beneficial to do simple, simpler movements to improve grip and forearm, forearm strength? Certainly at the beginning of one's training career to get more out of those bigger compound exercises or is that, not, is that unfounded? Is that not true? You know, um, it's a really interesting concept. And, and I, I, you know, I think when you look at large compound movements, uh, a deadlift, for example, where you have to have a, a great grip strength, based on the, the strength of your you know, posterior chain, uh, hamstrings and glutes and quads, um, depending on the, the style of deadlift you're doing, you know, your grip strength is probably going to be the weak link in relation to the load that you can actually lift. Um, and it might be true with the same thing with pull-ups or pull-downs and, and so forth. Um, so I think, yeah, a grip strength is, is a great example and maybe even to some extent biceps as well. Um, I think that there's probably at some end of the spectrum, if you're lifting, you know, a heavy enough load that you might need to either use lifting straps or specifically train grip strength to improve, uh, to, to, to allow you to, to perform those movements. Um, and there's no evidence surrounding it. It's, it's interesting that, that this is an area that's not been researched, but I mean, again, are we really going to get into the scientific research of it when we really know that you know, if you can deadlift, uh, you know, 300 or 400 pounds or more, then you, you probably weak link is going to be your hand grip. Um, so, you know, but, but then arguably, do you train it enough by performing the exercise? So, you know, there were studies by uh, Professor Paulo Gentile over in Brazil, where he looked at the addition of sort of single joint movements. So bicep curl and tricep extension in addition to chest press and pull down and found that, you know, adding single joint exercises didn't increase hypertrophy in, in those movements. So arguably they're the weaker muscles in the chain anyway, um, but there's no evidence to even show that they're the weaker muscles in the chain. So I think that, you know, I think there's probably arguments for and against based on time. If you've got the time to add in those other specific muscles, why not train them? If you haven't, then... Uh, as your lats and biceps get stronger in a in a pull down, then your forearm grip strength will will likely improve to to a similar degree, or or hopefully improve to a similar degree. Um, and and with a deadlift, the same. I'd have thought so. Yeah, I know that doesn't really answer it; it more discusses it. But I don't think there's no. an answer. I'm afraid. <laughs> no, it's interesting. So it's like if you've got if you're short on time, why bother? If you have time, why not? <laughs> I, I think that would be a fair approach. I think, you know, um, and I think you could probably throw it in here and there. You know, um, the use of grip strengthening exercises, I would probably add in as often as I would do sort of tibialis anterior exercises, maybe once every few weeks, once a month, once every six weeks, depending on how much time I had. You know, I always think that, that you know, you can almost do like a, a, a very much a peripherals workout, do some forearm rotation, pronation, supination, do some inversion, eversion at the ankle to strengthen the ankle. Um, or, or, or if you're not doing other movements like lunges, which might provide, you know, that strengthening uh, component in the, in the movement, um, you know, but why not add some, some small periphery exercises here and there and grip strength being one of them? Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, so let's talk about Pareto Law for a moment. Um, again, I, th I think we're treading over some old ground here, but uh, I didn't. That didn't really occur to me till like yesterday. But I, I think it's important just to. Th this is this is actually um, one I pulled from the uh, from Doug's blog from a from a reader. Really interesting question, which he said: If you're if you're using you know for argument's sake a controlled cadence, so not necessarily super slow, um, but you know a, a, a kind of high intensity training, um, you know controlled exercise speed, um, and if the first 20% of the effort gives you 80% of the results. Therefore, the first hard set gets you 80% of the 
you know the the the, the results you're looking yep. for, right? Um, free sets does does free sets therefore get you ninety ninety five percent of the results? And does five sets get you 98% and so on for less benefit, for ever more effort? Does that pan out in reality? What do you think about that? Uh, you know, I, I mean, Pareto's principle is, is, is pretty interesting. And the logic that it could apply to resistance training is, you know, seems, seems pretty sensible. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, as soon as you get onto the single multiple set debate, um, the idea is that there could be there could be greater returns for multiple sets for kind of three times the, the time and the effort. Well, maybe depending on what the mechanism of growth in your individual case is, if it's if it's metabolic stress and you're incurring more metabolic stress by doing a higher volume, uh, that's an if you are, not that you definitely are, because some people might not, depending on what they're doing. Um, then there might be very very small gains to be had by that increased volume um you know and if you've got that time to commit to it for for a bodybuilder um you know a pro bodybuilder who's going to spend hours and hours in the gym and based on their uh, steroid use can afford the, the time to recover from it um there might be greater gains to be had by it it, it, it seems it, it's a nice principle to have um I, I i'm not convinced by it myself i think that uh, you know, a, a single set that recruits as many motor units and muscle fibers as possible. And, and I'm going to use this actually to kind of link back to the conversation we just had about um, uh, John Kassler and Fred Hahn uh, having a little debate um, and James Krieger to, jumped in there as well on Facebook mm -hmm. about motor unit recruitment. Because I think I passed a comment in the last interview we did saying about recruiting all motor units and muscle fibers and John seemed to jump on this and say, oh, but you can never recruit all motor units and muscle fibers. And he's absolutely right. The, the evidence suggests you can recruit between 50, and I think the highest study has shown about 88% of motor units and, and, and thus muscle fibers. Um, and, and there's always kind of a safety net kept by the body um, to make sure we don't fatigue every muscle fiber, um, you know, just in case. Um, but, but if we can recruit as many as we can in a single set, then... We're not going to recruit more by doing a multiple by doing multiple sets, irrespective. Um, so, does three sets get you to that nineteen ninety five percent? Well, it's probably more likely to get you to eighty two percent if if it's a product of metabolic stress, not just muscle fiber recruitment. Um, and I think that you know we're talking about the law of diminishing returns here, and it's a, a lot more diminishing than three sets nineteen ninety five percent, five sets ninety eight percent. In my opinion, there's no evidence to support this either way, uh, and anybody who tells you otherwise is, you know, is is lying. So, but it's in principle, Pareto's principle sounds good, but I don't think it quite applies in that context. Mm. I think uh, I like I like the whole the whole eighty twenty rule totally applies though, doesn't it? With strength training, um, as it does to many other things in life, economics. Yeah. I think it does. I think it does. And I think this is, this is a part of our, you know, diminishing efficiency. The longer we spend doing something, the, the less efficient it will become. Uh, so, yeah, the idea of an 80-20 principle in strength training, you know, uh, you could look at it from, from the number of exercises we, we do, the, the number of days in a week we train, the time we train for, the volume we perform, you know, everything. So, yeah, it's, it's a nice approach to things. Cool. What are the potential shortcomings, in your opinion, if any, of a big five workout and or abbreviated two-way and three-way splits inspired by, obviously, the Body by Science book? You know, I, I have a confession. I read Body by Science years back, and it was only earlier this year in a discussion with Luke Carlson that, that I, I, we were talking about the big five workout, and I had to stop and say, can you just remind me what the big five <laughs> exercises are? Blasphemy. Because it been, yeah, I know. It had been that long since I looked at it. And we talked through it, and it was only when he reminded me that I was a bit surprised. Now, I would throw in the chest press, the leg press, a pull-down every day. You know, those would be the key three exercises. If I was only ever going to do three exercises, that would be it. Mm -hmm. the, the overhead press, I completely agree with, although we're starting to get quite anterior delt dominant with with an overhead press and a chest press. Um, and, and then the addition of a seated row... I struggle with, I don't think I would add, a, if I was only going to do five exercises, I wouldn't add a seated row to, to this 
to this mix, or I wouldn't have a seated row and a pull down. So the potential shortcomings of the big five from my perspective are there should be an exercise that's different for the for, uh, that doesn't include the upper back. There should be a lower back dominant exercise here. So I would like to see a lumbar extension in instead of either a seated row or a pull down. So that's my that's my opinion on the potential shortcomings. If I was really pushed, I'd maybe like to see a leg curl in there somewhere as well. Um, but that obviously depends on the full position of a leg press, as to whether it's more quad or glute hamstring dominant. Um, you know, arguably, I'd even maybe maybe like to see a Romanian deadlift in there, um, and then a, a knee extension exercise in there instead of the the leg press. So I think. I think the big five is a good starting point, but I, I would grow tired of it very quickly, personally. Um, after two and three day splits, I think, you know, ro rotating the exercises you do, splitting them over different days. I think for a short period of time, anything like this can, can work pretty well. And, and even for a long period of time, if you're really committed to it, um, will probably work pretty well. But I, I like more variety than this. Mm. So. Yeah, because obviously these are incredibly brief workouts. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly the two-way and three-way split, you know, they could be, you know, I've had a workout last six minutes. Um, yeah. And they, they double take when they see me come out, go out the gym because I've only just walked in. And yeah, I, I see what you're saying. But um, it's just a question I had about the leg press. So I, I'm interested because um, I actually recently worked out with Simon Shawcross um, around his okay. place on his um, his machine, which is great workout, fantastic instructor. Yeah, um, on the aisle, yeah. Yeah, and you, you know, you've, you've been trained by him before, haven't you, I think? Uh, do you know what? I've never, uh, uh, yeah, kind of. I've had a bit of a play on the uh, the all-in-one that he's got. I've never had a proper workout around there, uh, but I've seen Simon train uh, James Steele, uh, mm -hmm. and I know he's uh, he's incredibly knowledgeable and incredibly proficient trainer. Um, but yeah, at some point, uh, I will go over there and have a proper workout with him. Yeah, no, you should. Um, so anyway, we uh, yeah, so his machine has the leg press functionality, um, mm -hmm. but we preceded that with a um, leg curl or hamstring mm -hmm. curl. Um, and I was thinking, oh, that's interesting. Obviously, you know, he, he perhaps feels like um, the leg press isn't necessarily work, working the hamstrings and glutes or, or, or particularly, you know, that's just more so the hamstrings um, as much as the leg press. Um, is that true then? Is that, you know, I guess, it, like you said, it depends on the settings, but I don't know if it's standard setup on a leg press, is it is it not going to recruit the hamstring muscle fibers as effectively? Uh, do, do you know what? Um, from from a paper that I read some time back, it suggested there wasn't as much recruitment of the hamstrings. Um, but I, I, I'm I'm reluctant now to say anything, knowing how many cynics seem to listen to these podcasts, looking to shoot people down. Um, in, in my experience and in the research I read, albeit relatively dated, yeah, the the a, a leg press doesn't recruit the hamstrings to the same extent as the gluteals and probably the quadriceps. Um, okay. I, I think that probably very much does depend on foot position and leg position as well, though. So, But I, I like to, if I was going to add an isolated leg movement, I would probably add a leg curl to a leg press, yeah. Right, okay, cool. Um, okay, so you think that the short... Yeah, because I mean, when I, when I interviewed Doug recently, um, he talked about how, you know, it's not about you know <laughs> constantly reducing your frequency and and volume indefinitely it's about kind of ebbing and flowing so that yes you might reduce to a freeway split but then after a certain amount of time you'll then have enough recovery to go back into a big five or you know back into a high higher volume workout um and it's about kind of um I guess chopping and changing depending on where you are in terms of you know progression and the stresses in your life and everything that's going on. Do you kind of agree with that kind of chopping and changing between doing like a really low volume and then a high volume, or do you think that that's kind of unnecessary and actually you can just continue doing um, you know more extensive volume? And more no, movement? I think I think that I think there's some variety in the volume of what you're doing is probably really important. Um, I, I, and I think you hit you hit the note, you know, exactly right there on, on saying the stresses in your life. You know, stress is a stress, whether it's physical or whether it's mental or psychological or 
or any other, um, whether it's money or issues at work or issues at home or issues with the kids. That's a stress. That's going to cause stress hormones to be released. That's going to uh, inhibit your um, efficiency and your productivity in a workout, and it's certainly going to affect your recovery ability. Uh, nutrition, again, sleep patterns, so on and so forth. So all of these things, you know, if you can get the stars aligned for every workout, then heck, go in there and you can probably hit a big five or, or, or even more um, every workout that you want. Um, but, but, you know, that's going to happen for a period of time and then your body is going to start to fatigue a bit and you might need to throw in a week's rest or you might need to change sleep patterns or nutrition patterns or, you know, just go out and have a few beers and really wind down or something. I don't know. Um, I think there. Are, I think the variance is is really important um, from that perspective. I also think it's really important from a psychological perspective of the way we challenge our bodies, um, the way we, uh, you know, have uh, have some motivation to what we're doing. If you, you know, I go to some great facilities where they have, you know, uh, a limited a limited range of equipment, and and once a month or once every couple of months. Uh, to go in there and have a workout is fantastic, but I wouldn't want to go in there every single every single workout because I know that I'm limited to what I'm going to do. I, I, I want some variety. I want some mental stimulus in what I'm doing as well. Um, I'm not a robot that's solely committed to the most efficient workout possible <laughs> with, no, with no variation because I'm a human being. Yeah. Do you know, I, I, I did um, a modified version of James Steele's HIT workout on YouTube uh, probably a month back. Um, and I did it at home. When I say modified version, I hadn't done a bodyweight workout for probably six months plus. So, right. and I couldn't, and I, I, I work out pretty hard. I mean, you can ask Simon and Ted and these guys. I, you know, mm-hmm. I, I really do go to, to failure um, in the truest sense. But I couldn't do it. I was, I mean, I, I couldn't do one set to true failure. I had to rest pause in order mm-hmm. to really go to it because I was literally going to projectile across my living room. Um, and I did, yeah, I mean, I did push ups, chin ups, um, wall sit, et cetera. And I just felt, found it so challenging. And it goes back to what we were saying in our first, um, first interview of you was I had I was so out of condition on those particular movements and skills. Yeah. Um, so I was going to ask you. One, I get what you're saying about the variety and how appealing that is, and I, I am the same. But do you not get frustrated that there's always that skill element whenever you, which is the whenever you try something you haven't done for a while, which is the complete opposite, in my opinion, of what James Steele's able to do. I mean, he's able to you know work, do his chin ups incredibly slowly and. He's able to do those difficult movements forever, it feels like, you know? James is pretty uh, mechanistic in his processes and his training processes. Right. He can, he, he, he's got it down to what he uh, can do or what he wants to do, and that's it. He doesn't have much, he doesn't have a huge amount of variety. But then if you take him, you know, when we were in Germany, we trained at one of the Kieser facilities with Doug um, early one morning. And, and he treats that as like a, it's almost like a special present for him that he gets to go in and use some nice equipment. And, um, and he loves it, you know, but he doesn't want to do it too often because it, it loses the novelty value then. So I think, you know, I, I think it's, it's impressive that he can do that. I struggle to do that. Uh, you know, I train at the university facility where I work and I also, I'm also a member of another large chain where I can go in and some days I go in and do some free weights. Um, just for some variety and some days I go in and, and just stick with the machines and, um, and and there's a good range you know we've got uh, a plate loaded v-squat we've got a plate loaded uh, leg press uh, we've got uh, techno gym equipment there so there's good variety in what you can do if you want to uh, or if you want to do deadlift there's barbells and lifting platforms or if you just want to do a free weight squat you can just do a free weight squat so but yeah the skill element's interesting I always think that you should, uh, you know, if I go back and do a free weight squat now, I know that I'm probably going to have more soreness just as a result of doing a squat rather than doing a leg press because, you know, it's it's different. My body has moved differently. My body weight has moved differently. So it's uh, it's interesting. Here's a question. So if you do switch to a, a different movement, 
and, and like you, like we're saying, you're you're not you're you're not trained to do that movement, so you're not going to perform as well as having trained you know doing it over and over. Are you going to be triggering a greater metabolic stress and potentially better results through doing that because the body's you know it's it's going to fatigue so quickly? Is there any logic to what I'm saying? Sounds like an interesting study that. <laughs> that definitely sounds like an interesting piece of research. If we if we get it done, I'll be sure to mention you in the acknowledgements, Lawrence. Excellent. I um, I think um, I think that's a really interesting idea that that does variety affect metabolic rate, you know. But I, there's no evidence to support it because it's another one of those. We're getting into the real minutiae of training studies now, um, and no one's looked at these because there's there's bigger questions that needed answering. But I think that's a that's a really interesting idea. That you know, does, does does adding variety, you know, stress our body in different ways. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Okay, so right, let me just. There's another question. It's quite a lengthy one. Just make sure I get over it correctly. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this quote by um, Brad Schoenfeld. I wanted to get your your opinion on. So, if your goal is to build as much muscle as possible. It seems appropriate to train across the spectrum of loading zones using lighter loads to target type 1 fibers and heavier loads to target type 2s. In this way, you ensure maximal development of all fiber types. True or false and why? You know, Brad's a, Brad's a very, very clever guy. I, I would love for you to do a podcast with Brad if you ever, if you ever are interested in doing that yeah. because I would really like to hear his thoughts. Um, th- this concept, I mean... So, um, but, but what I was going to say is Brad's also selling books. So I think, I think that presenting a very a single-minded approach is going gonna, is gonna to wind up some people and, 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 uh, and, and turn some people away. Um, the idea of recruiting, of, of preferential recruitment of lighter loads with type 1, um, if you train to muscular failure, your type 1 motor units are eventually going to fatigue and you will have to have a higher drive to recruit type 2 motor units and muscle fibers, or, or higher threshold motor units and type 2 muscle fibers. So, you know, I think that there is a, a, an argument for using a reasonably heavy load, uh, a reasonably moderate load, um, just, you know, just to recruit everything anyway. But you would get there if you could with a type 1, or with a light enough load, sorry. The problem with using a very light load is that you'll probably never really reach true muscular failure because you'll either get bored somewhere along the way or you will um, your sort of central fatigue will kick in far before your sort of peripheral fatigue in the muscle. We're playing right now with the use of a dom- with the use of a, um, different scales to measure both uh, exertion and discomfort. So exertion, of course, is the amount of effort you're applying. When you reach muscular failure, you should be at an exertion of a maximal exertion anyway. But there's a degree in, in the amount of discomfort you feel. If you do a one RM, you know, squat, that's a maximal effort. That's not a hugely high discomfort though. Whereas if you do squats to failure with, you know, a hundred RM, well, that's going to be maximal effort, presumably, if you get there. But the discomfort of doing a hundred squats along the way is probably going to you know, cause a considerable amount of discomfort. Um, so it, it's not going to be much fun. So I think that most people will probably stop exercise shy of muscular failure if you use too light of a load, which kind of goes, goes along with the idea of using a heavy enough load. Um, I don't think that you can preferentially recruit type 1 motor units with a light load or type 2 motor units with a heavy load. So as a short answer to your question, I'm going to say, False. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, good, it's a good answer. So am I right in thinking that, you know, whatever load you use, you're going to eventually recruit all muscle, or mo- most of the muscle fibers if you go to failure with that given load? Yeah, I mean, if you're using a heavy enough load, then you're going to recruit type 2, type two muscle fibers. You're going to recruit high threshold motor units and type 2 muscle fibers. But you're going to recruit type one along the way anyway. So you know, using a heavy enough load is going to hit both. It's going to hit all, or should hit all muscle fibers. Um, if it's at a controlled enough pace, if it's particularly fast, there might not be the same recruitment of type one. There is some discussion around that in the literature, but I'm not convinced. If I'm honest, if you use too light a load, 
like I said, central fatigue will probably kick in. Sure, you'll recruit the, the type 1 muscle fibers and, and, you know, stimulate adaptation from them, but you probably won't get to all the type 2s. So it, it's great in logic. And, I, and actually, what I do like is I like the idea of using different loads anyway, just for, again, for mental stimulus. I went through a phase a while back where I would go in the gym and I made a point of never changing the pin in the weight stack or never loading or unloading a bar. So if the bar was preloaded with a certain weight, then I would deadlift that weight. Uh, and if it took 30 or 40 reps, I just went, okay, that's fine. If the pin stack is if the pin is in the bottom of the stack, then I might do, you know, rest pause reps. So and, and I found it quite interesting to do it because you never really know what you're going to get when you go in the gym. Um, <laughs> But, but it also means that you, one day you do a chest press and you do, you know, the stack uh, and you do maybe six, eight, ten rest, pause reps, whatever it might be, depending on the weight stack and how strong you are on that day. And the next day you go in and it's a third of the way down the stack. So you maybe slow the cadence down and do super slow or you maybe just do a higher number of reps and you just adjust the workout. You just adapt it a bit. So That's cool. That, that was quite interesting. I would advocate that for anybody who's just looking for a bit of variation in their workout. I think that's a nice, a nice idea. So, so when you say if you've got, if it's like the whole stack and you rest pausing, you're literally doing like one rep and then you're done and then you pause and then try and do another one. So it's like one rep max type of approach to that. Is that what you're, is that what you mean? Have I got that right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so for example, so for example, the chest press uh, of this particular machine brand uh, in, in this particular facility, I can stack for about, I, I can rep for about five reps, the weight stack. So I would do five reps and then I would do rest pause. So then I would pause for as long as I felt necessary and then go again and do another rep and try another rep if I could. Um, with with one of the machines, uh, which was um, a leg extension actually, somebody had set it on the stack and I'm not going to stack out this leg extension for more than one or two reps. So I did one rep, and then I just did a time static. I just held it for as long as I could. So, so the end in the end, the eccentric. It was it was sort of one rep with about a seventy five or something like that, seventy five second eccentric contraction. Um, but it but it it made for an interesting workout. It made for a bit of a novel approach. You know, it's like having a trainer. You never really know what that trainer is going to give you to do on that given day. So I just looked at it as well. The machine's going to give me something different to do. So. Yeah. So do you feel like, you know, this is for you just a bit of fun, doing something different, mixing up the protocols, but at the end of the day, whatever you're doing, you're going to get the same result. Is that fair uh, enough? That, that's pretty much my opinion on things, yeah. I think once, you know, I've reached the point where I'm, I'm certainly what would be considered trained. Um, although, ironically, I don't fit in with the ACSM criteria of trained because I don't train to a high enough volume. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they they want me to do more than a lot more minutes per week than I do at the moment. Um, but you know, yeah, I think you're going to get the same results. So sometimes I'll throw in forced reps if I'm if I've got a training partner. I'll throw in some slow negatives. I'll maybe do some super slow here and there if if I want, or or some pre exhaust or post exhaust or breakdown sets. But I don't think that there's a great benefit from a muscular perspective. I think that there's a greater benefit from a a mental stimulus. Yeah, I agree. Um, and that kind of brings me on to the next question, which is kind of along the same vein, which is, um, in your opinion, you know, as long as you address the entire body's musculature through whatever movements and, you know, you know, really doesn't matter as long as you're doing them safely um, and, like I say, covering the whole, the whole musculature and you're doing one set to momentary muscular failure once or twice a week, you're going to invoke as good as results as you can in terms of you know, positive aesthetic adaptations. Is that, do, you, do you think that's, that's true and, and that's, that's just all, all you need really to get the best results? Um, I think if we're going to say optimal, if we're going to say the best results you can get, then you probably have to play around with it a little bit and, and find what's working well for you with certain times based on nutrition, sleep patterns, so on, all the variables like we talked about. Yeah, um, I mean, those, so, those variables aside, just in terms of the exercise modality. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, okay. yeah. I was going to say, I think there's, from my perspective, you know, the evidence supports, it's really interesting. I don't consider myself a, a member of the sort of 
hip community. James Krieger, you know, in one of his blogs a while back said that something I said was typical of somebody from the hip community. And I don't consider myself part of the hip community. Partly, I, I'm not a big fan of the term high intensity training. <laughs> intensity doesn't, doesn't really mean much. And, and high intensity training has just been associated with a lot of people that, you know, already have a bias to certain things or a romantic affiliation to Nautilus or Menex equipment, which on the one hand is great, but I don't think that's, that's a scientific approach. But I am, I do believe that the evidence supports, you know, a logical, rational approach to training um, where you recruit, you know, muscle fibers using a single set approach going through momentary muscular failure um, in a safe, in a safe way. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's um, that's a good answer. What well, talk to, talk to him about your what are you doing currently in terms of your workouts? How they, I mean, they might not have changed since we last we last spoke. But talk me through your current training regime. I mean, you're in pretty good shape. I was watching your your uh, videos or is it other videos or pictures with Luke Carson? Um, you guys were in London. Thanks for the invite. You know, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <Lash. laughs> no, um, no, it's fine. He, he was over for a week and we did it we did like a a, a, a UK tour of, of gyms it was pretty crazy actually oh, um, wow. my, my wife thought it was, it was ridiculous there's a guy flown over from the US and all I'm taking him to is, is you know fitness facilities <laughs> but he uh, yeah we had some good workouts uh, right now I'm on a bit of an interesting workout because I have um, uh, torn my uh, TFCC which is cartilage in my left wrist um, and I did that playing basketball. So, so this is, sports is bad for you. Lifting weights is good for you. <laughs> Do you know what I love? I love. I don't obviously love the fact that you've hurt yourself, but it's, this really reminds me of what you said in the first interview because I was like, we were talking about sport, and you were like, "Do you know what? I just, I just don't think sport is very good for you." Um, <laughs> and this really kind of confirms it. Although I will caveat that and say that you are obviously not a bore you you appreciate sport and you obviously used to play basketball a lot in your your past uh, and and respect those that do still play a lot of sport uh, I, I i i love sport i love yeah. it I, I think that you know i think it's probably the best thing you can do with your time but i think that if it's from a health if it's purely from a health perspective people are a bit misguided um pr- probably the biggest problem i have right now is i've hurt my wrist which means i can't cycle i can't get mountain biking i can't go surfing oh, man. and i can't and I can't lift weights with my left hand. So right now, you asked about my workout. My workout is lower body dominant, and then it's unilateral. So every press is a chest press or a shoulder press with, with my right side only, uh, or, a seat, or a seated row or a pull down with my right side only. There's a, a lot of uh, side bends, single arm deadlifts, like dumbbell deadlifts, um, <laughs> Leg press, leg extension, leg curl, adductor, abductor, I'm still quite enjoying because I can do, train both sides of the body. But it's a very bizarre feeling to, to finish a workout and, and feel, you know, that pump on, on your right side of the body only. <laughs> have, have you ever seen Lady in the Water, the movie? Uh, no, I don't think so. So uh, it's a movie by, I can never pronounce the guy's last name. Is it M. Night Shyamalan, the guy behind Sixth Sense and Science yeah. and those films? Yeah. Um, yeah. So in this movie, there's this character and he just works out one side of his body and he's huge on one side. And I don't know if it's real or if he just, if it's fake or, or computer generated, I'm not sure, but it looks so real. And the other side of him is stick thin. And, yeah. and the guy's like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm doing this cool experiment, you know? <laughs> um, and I'm just picturing you looking like that, although obviously I'm sure you don't. But, uh, uh, you know, are you not, are you not uh, worried that your, your other side's going to decondition from the... Or, or... I, I, I'm very worried that my other side <laughs> will decondition, but the, there's a lot of evidence to support that if you train uh, the contralateral side of the body, it will at least reduce the effects of deconditioning um, of immobilization, so um, I'm, I'm very much p- pinning everything on that right now. <laughs> if I keep training the right side of my body, then the left side of my body won't weaken too much. And and in uh, four to six weeks, I'll let you know how I've gone. <laughs> yeah, no. How did you do it anyway? How did you do the injury? Do you know what, Lawrence? I, I reckon I played basketball for the best part of twenty years, and then I probably took uh, quite a few year layoff, and then went back and started scrimmaging on a Saturday afternoon. And um, getting fouled, getting fouled in a layup. There's, you know, when the, the kind of the, the wall of the sports hall is just that bit too close to the basket. Uh, it's just not, 
Yeah, just so a waiting to happen. Yeah, so I got fouled and fell, and I was very much falling just just at the perfect point to get my head against the wall and put my left hand down, but it was so deep into the corner of the wall that it put my wrist back pretty bad, and um, and and I ignored it for a good three to four weeks, and in the end, couldn't ignore it any longer. So, <laughs> and uh, sure sure enough, it's uh, it's a bit of a tear in my wrist. So before you did that, how did you find your condition? on the basketball court. Was it full court you were playing? Yeah, we were playing full court. Uh, do you know what? It, it was interesting. My condition was never really challenged because the guys we were really? playing with had a tendency to throw, um, you know, very, very long passes as if somebody wanted to be a quarterback with a wide receiver. And, and most of these passes never amounted to anything except, you know, overshoot their player. They're, they was, <laughs> they're, they're really nice guys. I hope they never listen to this because I'm about to to slate them. They're really nice guys, but they're, they're not. It wasn't structured basketball. Okay. Um, so it was, uh, there was a lot of running up and down without any purpose. So it made it quite interesting from that perspective, but I didn't feel like my conditioning was ever challenged. Uh, my feet got a few more blisters than I was used to. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, um, I, when I did, so to give you a good comparison, I did, um, having done high intensity training, I know you hate that, but uh, let's call it evidence-based <laughs> yeah. resistance exercise. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, for for quite a long long period, I then did the free peak challenge in under twenty four hours. So for the oh, yeah? um, for the American Americans listening, that's um, Scarfell, which is a, 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 one of the tallest mountains in the UK in the Peak District. Uh, ben Nevis in Scotland, which is the tallest mountain in the, in the UK, uh, and Mount Snowdon in Wales. So they're the top the top three peaks. Um, mm. And we were the only team to do it with this particular guide in under 24 hours. Um, I did no training, no, spe- I should say, specific training for the the task, whereas the rest of them did. Um, and I was one of the first ones down the bottom of the mountain at the end of it. I mean, it destroyed me, absolutely killed me. And obviously, you know, you're doing it all in 24 hours. There's no barely any sleep and horrible conditions and rain and bad weather, etc. Um, but it was fascinating to me because I was like, wow, you know, this, this training has really, you know, gave me a good foundation. You know, I've been able to do this and I don't think I would have been able to do it anywhere near as well if I wasn't strong, you know? Um, but go on, do you want to, do you want to comment? No, I think, I think, you know, that's completely true of a lot of things. When I first got into, into road cycling, um, so my wife is a, or was a very, very good triathlete and is a very, very good cyclist. And when I first bought my, I bought my first road bike, it was only a few years back, and I found myself, you know, going on 50-mile rides, which I'd never done before, at a, at a reasonable pace. And I would struggle a little bit towards the end, but for the most part, I was, you know, I was able to hold my own reasonably well. Um, and, and yeah, a lot of it comes from the, the foundation of high-intensity training, of, of training at a high level of effort, putting yourself in that level of discomfort, being able to do that, but strengthening the muscles and the body well enough to do it. So, mm-hmm. Where I found it didn't work as well <laughs> is when I played basketball for the first time in a long time, um, full court, com- quite a competitive game against a team that are probably you know, as good as the team I was playing for. And, you know, they're, they're much younger and less experienced, but they play very regularly, so they're very fit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all I'd been doing is, you know, high intensity strength training sort of once a week. And, mm-hmm. um, and I, I found that I was exhausted. I was, I was well out of condition. Um, and I attribute that to basically not playing. And wh- what I, I was talking about to Simon and Simon was saying, yeah, well, when you did free peaks, you're not, it's not as intense. You're not uh, fatiguing the muscle as much because you're doing a lot of like you know low intensity work because it's not like you know it's a steep mountain but it's not super steep. Um, whereas mm-hmm. on the basketball court you're exploding, you're jumping, you're doing a lot of sprinting, and therefore you d- you need that specific training in order to perform at that level in that sport. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, and I, and I agree. I think that the muscle damage you do. In the in the you know cuts in the in the agility movement in the jumping so so high tension concentric movements a lot of eccentric movements in landing and like I said change of direction so you're doing a different amount of muscle damage there that your body's not used to so um, yeah physically conditioned but not physically conditioned for the, for certain movements mm. so 
Yeah, I don't think sitting at a desk a lot helps either. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so so there, there's a number of things. Obviously, we could talk about that particular scenario for ages as a ton of variables to consider, I suppose. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay, so a question, one of the questions that someone submitted is a couple of questions, actually, which I wanted to ask you. Um, is, you know, we always talk about hypertrophy. You know, you said last time we spoke, Every guy just wants to know how to get big muscles. That is true. Um, but obviously, there's tons and tons of other benefits uh, of resistance exercise um, that get forgotten quite quite often. Um, and one of those is just improving joint, ligament, and tendon health. Um, and I was wondering if you'd be able to explain, you know, what, are the, what is the evidence around that um, that supports that strength training it improves joint health? And do you think that, the type of protocol we're talking about today is is more effective for that end than traditional multiple set high volume training. Yeah, there's there's good evidence to support. This isn't really my area of expertise, but I'll I'll try no and problem. think back. Um, there is good evidence to support that resistance training is good for joint, ligament, tendon health. Um, there's good evidence, certainly in rat models, that show that. Um, mobility or that movement sorry is better for realignment and restructuring of the collagen fibers than immobilization um so so as far as even repair i would suggest it's better but certainly um tendon strength you know we normally see uh, uh muscle strength improve first and tendons take a lot longer to adapt but they do adapt um and I think from what I recall, ligaments the same, but if I'm wrong and if that's your area of expertise when you're listening, then I apologize. Uh, is it more effective than traditional weight training is a really good question. Uh, honestly, very doubtful. Um, I think as long as the movements are safe, as long as you're not doing something that's going to cause damage to these uh, joints or, or, or you know, uh, tissues around the joint, whether it's ligaments or tendons, then... Um, yeah, I think probably most resistance training modality is the same. I can't imagine that there would be huge, hugely larger amounts of stress applied by multiple set approaches. If there was, if it was an incredibly high volume, then I'm sure there would be. You know, you hear of bodybuilders who, who you know, periodically would tear um, ligaments or tear tendons because of how strong their muscles were partly, but also because of the high volume of training they were doing. And also because steroids are not great for, for tendons and ligaments, actually. So that might be worth knowing. Interesting. Um, yeah, so, but I, I very much doubt that high intensity training or low volume, you know, evidence-based training is better for joint health than, than anything else. Um, be interesting to, to look at it from that approach. I, again, I don't know the research on that. Mm. The bottom line is, is that, you know, strength training will improve joint health. It yeah. Is, is, yeah, is a, a listener emailed in asking about that and, and I was sort of put my case forward to say yes and here's why, but it's just wanted you to kind of verify that, I suppose. Um, yeah. Going back to basketball for a moment, uh, Kobe yeah. is obviously announced that he's um, he's going to be retiring this se- at the end of this season. I don't know if you yeah, he keep, keep tabs on that. Um yeah. Do you, do you know much about the injury he had, which was because he had a, I think, was it part a tendon from his shoulder or something that literally detached from the bone or something like that? Um, and, and, and Kobe, in typically his stoic fashion, just looked at the doctor and said, okay, what do I, what do, I do to fix this sort of thing? Um, do you know much about that, about his injury and kind of what's caused him to kind of go, you know what, I'm, I'm ready to throw in the towel kind of thing? I don't know much about his injury. My guess, if you say it's shoulders, it's probably rotator cuff. Yeah. Uh, they're notoriously bad and, 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 uh, and difficult to, to maintain, uh, especially with conventional exercises. As soon as you abduct and externally rotate a shoulder, which is probably most people's shoulder press, uh, rotator cuffs can get a bit dodgy anyway. So I would guess it was probably that. he. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of his trainer that he used to work with in Chicago. Uh, Tim, somebody who was at one point George, Michael Jordan's trainer as well. Um, you know, I guess he probably would have been the first phone call he made about rehabbing his shoulder. As for why he's retired, well, my guess is that he's had 20 years in the NBA and picked up five championship rings and done pretty much everything there is to do. And he's, not, and he's now sat with a Lakers team that are really unproductive. Um, so I can imagine that 
there's a lot of uh, a lot of the enjoyment has probably gone from the game a little bit, and he's got to be thinking a bit longer term about his body. Um, I can remember this guy when he came in the NBA when he won the dunk contest at 18 years old. Uh, you know, when he was when he was just purely uh, you know show um, with the Lakers, and and really exciting to watch. I was never his biggest fan. Um, but he, uh, yeah, I can imagine it's just taken its toll on him and, you know, he's matured a lot since then and he probably is just tired. <laughs> Do you think if Kobe were to quit at the end of the season and do everything in his power to look after his body, so, you know, switch to, a, I guess, a, a high-intensity style workout, um, mm-hmm. eat, eat incredibly well, you know, sleep well, all the things he can do to, 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 to look after his body going forward. Do you think that is um, not going to reverse the damage he's done already? So where I'm going with this is, like Doug says, will the crows come home to roost in 10, 20 years? And is it going to really affect his quality of life in the future, do you think? You know, uh, there's a lot of evidence around, um, you know, a higher percentage of, uh, of people who've been sports having, having arthritis and having more severe arthritis. Uh, I think most of the research is around American footballers, actually. Yeah. Um, but they, they probably have a lot shorter careers than most basketball players. So I can imagine that at some point he'll, he'll pay the price a little bit. I think when you do something as, as frequent, you know, you've got to remember how rigorous the NBA season is and how hard it's been for a player like Kobe where he's played probably, my guess is he's probably played 40 plus minutes on average per game yeah. and then played in, in multiple, you know, your um, world championships and Olympic games and things like that and playoffs. So it's been extended to probably an average of about 90 or 100 games most of those 20 seasons. Uh, Yeah, I think that's probably going to come back. He's probably going to pay the price at some point, even if it's just discomfort in his knees and ankles, um, you know, moving around. Uh, I'm sure he is intelligent enough that he takes a very... Um, a very holistic approach to looking after his body anyway but I think yeah I think Doug's probably right I think the crows are going to come home to roost at some point yeah because just a mileage like you were saying about 80 games or whatever it is uh, you know international games and then just the training I mean the guy was a at boy still is a he's relentless isn't he I heard I read an article that's saying that he he puts up 800 makes so jump shots made jump shots like before 8 a.m. or something like. Yeah, you there's know. been some. Yeah, there's been some interesting stats like that, and he apparently doesn't. Uh, early on in his career, I read somewhere that uh, when he's doing like shooting drills, if it doesn't, if it doesn't just hit the bottom of the net, if it hits the rim, he doesn't count it as a make. <laughs> like, it, it has to go through the center of the rim and just hit the net, and if it hits anything else, it doesn't count. So, Jesus. But that is- it's, it's interesting that you bring up basketball and, and you talk about Kobe's retirement but not Golden State's 24-0 start to a season. Oh, we can talk about that. But you know that's been cut short now, don't you? I, oh, really? Has it ended? Yeah, the Bucks beat him the other night. The Bucks. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, of all teams. <laughs> yeah. Is, is Jason Kidd still coaching the Bucks though? So. Uh, I don't know. I th- think so i don't know i'm uh, i only catch the highlights so i'm not um, right yeah it's kind of my my evening dinner ritual is i just uh I flick through the highlights on my phone um, yeah but they have got a pretty good team bucks i got that jabari parker who's uh i think he was like number two pick last year or something like that um yeah. they've got some good players so yeah they um it was yeah they they beat him quite quite impressively i think if i remember um, yeah, I, I know the Golden State have got Clay. I don't know if Clay Thompson is still out injured and. Um, he, yeah, he he was uh, he was back, but he wasn't playing too well. Right, right, and uh, and um, somebody Barnes as well. I can't remember his name now. He was out Harrison as well. Barnes. Yeah. Harrison Barnes. Yeah. Mm. So, but hey, what a start for the season! Incredible, just incredible. It's Stephen Curry is a freak in nature. Um, just so confident. It's, yeah, it's it's quite amazing to watch. Yeah. Um, Cool. Okay, we God, we should do another podcast on basketball. <laughs> Very bo- boring the listeners of the basketball talk, but there, there, was, there was relevance to it. Um, okay, so another another question. Um, it's, it's another question submitted. Uh, quite a, a broad question, and yeah, just just see how how you answer this one. But um, they've asked, 
How have your views on exercise and nutrition evolved over time? What's the trend been for you? Yeah, well, it's I, uh, <laughs> I, think I, I think I've done it all. I started with a high volume approach years back. You know, I was listening to Fred Hahn's podcast the other day and he said, you know, when he was 10, he was quite, uh, quite skinny and then he, he discovered Nautilus or high intensity training um, and he was suddenly, you know, packed on the muscle and this, that and the other. You know, I, I was a swimmer when I was young, so I was generally pretty muscular anyway. Um, and I kind of had my growth spurt quite early, which is how I ended up playing basketball. Um, and I always did a, a high volume approach to training. I did, you know, split routines. I don't think I ever lifted weights twice in one day, but if I probably had the energy to do it, I might have tried it. Um, and I, you know, made good gains. And, and I'm going to go against the grain here and say I don't have any better gains with single set, you know, high intensity training than I ever did with a more high volume approach. But what I do is have a lot more free time in a day and a week. My nutrition, I, I, I generally... James, uh, can I, I, just, I, I just want to interject there just quickly. Um, sure. Do you think if you'd started off doing, you know, the training you do now, that you would have made those beginner gains anyway? Um, or not? Probably, yeah. I, well, I think when you're, when you're young or when you're younger, when you're first, when you're untrained beginning training, you can probably accommodate a higher volume of training um, because you don't use the same loads so your body can recover um, from a central perspective a bit better. Um, you, you also learn the skills of the movement a bit better. So if you've never trained before, doing three, you know, you're unlikely to reach muscular failure on a bench press. But if you do three sets of it, then you're probably more likely to improve the neural aspect um, better by doing three sets of it. So, you know, from that perspective, somebody who's completely naive to training m might, there could be an argument for a higher volume approach. I'm not advocating a high volume approach. I'm saying that there's a rational argument for it. But I don't, I, I think from my perspective, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to go back and say what would or wouldn't have worked for me uh, when I was younger. I did, um, you know, three sets of most things and I did, you know, chest and back and legs and shoulders or chest and tries and arms and thighs and back. And, and I tried multiple splits and did, you know, most things that we see in the magazines um, before I read much of Bael Darden and Arthur Jones and went to a, a lower volume approach and then had the same results. So from a, nutri from a nutritional perspective, I've gone through phases where I eat everything I want and don't think twice about it. Uh, um, to, to being like pretty strict paleo to, you know, intermittent fasting to, you know, high dose supplements of, you know, I know Doug was talking about branched chain amino acids and, you know, and things like that. And so I, I've tried, I, I think I've tried most, you know, rational approaches. Um, for me right now, uh, you know, I, generally don't eat anything before midday, but that just seems to work well for me. I'm not particularly hungry in the morning. Um, I normally have something to eat before a workout, you know, an hour or two before a workout, just because I, I don't like to train fasted. Um, and then after I've had a workout, I normally take an approach of, of trying to get, you know, good sources of protein in throughout the rest of the day. Um, I, I like fruit and vegetables, so it's pretty easy for me from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, if I crave a bag of potato chips, uh, a, a bag of crisps, I should say, we're English after all, then, then I, I have a bag of crisps. If I want a Snickers bar, I have a Snickers bar. I, I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not anal over this. I, I pretty much eat what I want within reason. Yeah. I struggle with that kind of, you know, every now and again have a little snack because I fall off the wagon if I do that. Um, I, I'm much, I'm much better at something like the slow carb diet, which is, you know, six days, you know, quite, quite, you know, very healthy kind of paleo esque yep. approach with, with, with beans. Um, and then the, the one day where I just, you know, have whatever I like, but, um, yeah, I've kind of chopped and changed between that doing what you do and then trying like a full on monk approach, like, you know, kind mm. of like the, the bulletproof diet, I suppose, where you're just eating, well all the time uh, if you if you yeah. consider that that well anyway which is a you know controversial topic in itself um what health hacks do you employ if any so 
mentioned that on my email to you. So things like you know, supplementation, food or exercise timing you've already mentioned, sleep enhancements. You know, do you wear blue blockers at night so that you can sleep better when you're watching TV? I know people that actually do that. Um, you know, what what things do you do that you've learned through, I guess, reading and through your the discipline you're involved in to try and improve your health, if anything? Yeah, sure. I, I don't know how much of it's evidence-based. I generally take an omega-3 supplement uh, most days. I'm n- Again, I'm not super you know, obsessed about making sure I take one every day, but I, I generally take one every day, but I tend to vary my diet, so I probably am more concerned about taking it if I haven't had fish in my diet for a while. Um, in the winter, I probably take a vitamin D tablet most days. Um, because there's, we're not getting as much sunshine from that perspective. Do you believe um, in, um, so, so just on that, Asprey, Dave Asprey talks about how you need, he thinks, I think it's 1,000 international units per 25 pounds of body weight, um, which would mean that someone like me who's about 175, 180 pounds would need like, whatever that is, seven, 8,000 units. Do you believe that? Or if not, what do you, uh, what sort of dosage do you, do you, do you find works for you? I think mine are 2,500, um, oh, wow. and I, I I don't go crazy. I think that's the highest dosage I could find at the time. Um, and I, um, yeah, I've never really given it, I've never really been obsessive about reading about how much you should take. I try and be outdoors as much as I can, um, and I know that in the winter I'm not going to get as much sun anyway, so that's why I take it in the winter rather than the summer. But again, I'm not obsessive about it. Um, I take some B vitamins um, sometimes, uh, but again, I'm not obsessive about it. Um, I generally try to avoid my phone for the last hour before going to sleep, but that's not always the case. Um, I probably drink way too much coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't take any any other supplements. I take a protein shake now and then. I'm what brand? Have- uh, right now, it is. I think it's just affordable supplements. Diet way, um, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I mostly look down the ingredients list, get something that's somewhere between horrendously expensive and you know ridiculously cheap, and something that's pretty bad and 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 you know fantastic. So I, I tend to go more moderate, um, but I only tend to take it training days anyway. I'm not. I don't get up and have a protein shake. I don't set an alarm for 4 a.m. to have a protein <laughs> shake and, and things like that. Um, probably the biggest thing that I do do is, um, is uh, my wife, uh, uh, we've got a friend and we managed to get hold of a couple of Fitbits at, 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 at like sort of cost price. And Fitbits have on it, um, or they're meant to give you feedback on your sleep, on, your, on how long you slept in a night. And um, I don't know how reliable it is. But I found that I wasn't sleeping as much as I thought I was. So I now make more of an effort to be in bed with the lights off, with the book down uh, for, for a longer period of time. Um, like I said, I don't know how reliable it is, but I use, I use my Fitbit um, rather than count my 10,000 steps a day or wherever else it is. In fact, I don't even wear it through most days. I put it in the evening to go to sleep. I, I look at it for, for how much sleep I'm getting. That's cool because um, I I was using the Sleep Cycle app on my phone, but then I didn't like the idea of having my phone in my bed with me. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, if I had it my way, you know, the, the, myself and my girlfriend would have our phones, in, you know, the, in a different room to where we sleep. Um, yeah. But that's that's difficult to try and get her to do that. So <laughs> so uh, so so, but I I'm a little. I must say I, I'm not. I, you know, I, I carry my phone on my person quite a bit, and I'm sometimes I'm a little paranoid about the whole. You know, carrying an electronic device on your person is that going to be bad for you? And you know, Ferris talked about how he took his phone out of his pocket and it trebled his sperm count and this kind of thing. But um, what about this? The Fitbit on your wrist and the Bluetooth or whatever. It did. Would you? Do you have any thoughts about that? And and. Do you, does that bother you at all, or, or you really just think, no, nah, it's not that much of a problem? If I'm honest, I probably don't give it much thought. If I stop and think about it, I probably would like to avoid it. Um, I probably would like to go to a more natural approach to life without all the, the blue light and Bluetooth and everything else. Um, but from a practical perspective, it's just too easy to have there and to use. So I, I'm suckered in and I use it. 
<laughs> so <laughs> good yeah. answer there's um, a couple of things I want to ask but I'm aware that we got seven minutes is that right you you got a hard stop at 20 past yeah uh, yeah just after let, I, I'll give I'll give abbreviated answers I have a tendency to talk a lot but I'll give abbreviated no, answers no it's good we'll, it's we'll good get, we'll get through it <laughs> I'll get, so I'm going to ask you one more question then um, okay. and then we'll you know I'll um, we'll dro- drop the links and, uh, and your contact details so last question and I love this question. What have you changed your mind about in health and fitness in the last year? Um, if anything. Yeah, this is not a quick answer. Um, I, it's all good, you've got gave, six minutes. <laughs> okay, I gave a lecture um, to the Fitness Leaders Summit in October of 2014. And it left me, it really left me thinking. Because the, the, the purpose of the Fitness Leaders Alliance um, is really to improve the the, idea, the level of professionalism in exercise and health and fitness industry and so on and so forth. And in the past year, I've become more and more dismayed by this. And, and I really don't want, if you're a trainer or if you're an exercise professional, don't think that I'm having a stab at you because this is maybe a very limited sample size. But one of the problems is that a lot of people come into this industry and step out again reasonably soon because they realize that maybe they're not built for it, or maybe there's not the longevity of it, or so on and so forth. But, but there's also there's a, a fashion. The exercise industry is fashion-orientated, and this is the frustrating part for me. Uh, and, and with it, you have, um, you know, CrossFit right now is the big fashion, okay? And CrossFit will, will come and go, and it, and it will go in the same way that Olympic lifting 10 years ago was big, and Zumba is, is not as big as it once was, and so on and so forth. And high intensity training in the form of Nautilus and Medex, um, you know, is, is was kind of big a long time back, and it's probably coming back around again. So there's a, there's very much a fashion approach, but with that you get these you get experts of that of that modality of training, and they they seem to almost reject some degree of science and evidence uh, in favour of just the pure enjoyment of that kind of training. Um, and, and I think that there's, I said to you before, there's a confirmation bias in, in, in exercise. People read what they're attached to. Most people listening to this podcast have probably read everything by L. Darden or, or James Steele or, or Fred Hahn, but they probably haven't read Brad Schoenfeld or James Krieger. They probably, uh, you know, have rejected some of the other things. And, and that's as bad as, that's as, as bad as any approach. They need to, we need to be more we need to look more at the other approaches to exercise, to, to, to what we can learn from them, but also to critique them and critique our own perspective or defend our own viewpoint, our own, our own standpoint. Um, there's, a, there's a quote, I can't remember who it's by, but there's a quote that says, what we know is infinitely less than all that there is to know. And, and I think that that's true about exercise and we get people that come along and go, high intensity training, great, I've done this course and I've read that book and now I'm going to, you know, talk, tell people about high intensity training. And, and to some extent, that's really, really good and I love it. But on the other hand, they, they then attach themselves to that without critiquing it because somebody's told them how good it is. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I get frustrated when people ring fence me. We spoke earlier on about uh, John Castle and Fred Hahn had a, a little, uh, a, an interesting little discussion on Facebook. And there was a comment about my, one of them commented on my meta-analysis, on my critique of Krieger's meta-analysis, that this is typical of somebody who preaches single set training to, you know, uh, discredit a, a multiple set meta-analysis. And, and in it, I said, you know, I think I said something like future research might support that multiple set training is more beneficial than single set training, but this isn't it. I, I, and I think that we have to be, we have to be more critical. We have to be more challenging. You know, um, with no disrespect to Dave Landau, he came on your podcast and challenged James Steele over his training methods and, and his nutritional habits. And, and some of his comments suggested that he could, you know, pack on loads of muscle onto James Steele. And you sort of think, well, Dave was around at a time that, you know, the glory days of high intensity training with Nautilus and Medex and Jones and, and the like. But what, what has he learned since then? What has he challenged since then? That's what I'm more interested in knowing. You know, if he's just, you know, talking about the romantic days of Medex and Nautilus and that, that's great. But, you know, 
has he has he moved on from this? Has his thinking evolved from this? And, and that's not I'm not targeting Dave Landau. He's a from everything that I know, he's a great guy. Um, but that's the biggest. I understand that's the your biggest, point there. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. If you, if you say, you know, um, my perspective of health and fitness in the last year is why have we got so many freaking experts? <laughs> so, yeah, that sounds like I've just really ripped into everybody in the expert No, it's, it's well said because um, Landau did get a lot of flack after the podcast with me because, you know, it, it, you could argue that he didn't give very satisfactory answers to a lot of the questions I had. You know, he kept saying that I should come over to the US and train with him, which I'd absolutely love to do. It'd be a great experience because I'm sure he's a fantastic trainer, but it wasn't necessarily a useful answer. Um, and, and I thought that a lot of his answers, you know, weren't weren't satisfactory. And that was made evident by a lot of the, the lot of the listeners. And, and we, you know, he's probably going to come on for a, a part two in order to, um, you know, answer a lot of those questions. But sorry, you were going to say. I was just going to say, from the from the one perspective, I, I absolutely love the podcast, and I'm not saying that because I'm on it. I love it because, for example, I love hearing Steve Maxwell talk about uh, you know muscle dysmorphia and steroids, or the idea of shortening life, you know, lifespan with bigger muscles. I love hearing about um, you know I love Bill De Simone. He's just an unbelievably uh, you know intelligent guy with a really critically or analytical approach to things. Bill's very open minded. Um, you know, uh, Fred, Dave, um, you know, people like that. You know, I love hearing their stories. I love hearing their experiences and their anecdotes. Um, but I, I also want to hear them, you know, say, like, I think this is a great question that you've asked me. What have I learned? What, what, what would I, what have I learned over the last year that was different from what I previously thought? Um, and, I, and I think that these are guys I would want to know. Hey, what have you learned? What have you, what have you changed your mind on? Um, uh, you know things like that. So I don't know. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a like I, sorry. Go on. And like I said before, I would love to hear. Um, you know, you do a podcast with the likes of maybe James Krieger or, or um, Brad Schoenfeld. Uh, I know uh, Steve Maxwell mentioned Richard Winnett. Um, he might be really interesting to talk about. He's got some great ideas around exercise. So maybe some of the people that maybe challenge these these ideas around high intensity training, so that people can either defend it. Or can can hear another perspective. Yeah, no, I think it's a fantastic idea, and I'm they're on my list, and I will be reaching out to them. So if you're <laughs> listening, I'm coming for you. <laughs> um, no, that's that's a, that's a really good point. It's, it is a, it's so important to stay objective uh, and open minded, and sometimes it's the hardest thing to do. Um, for everyone listening, if you want to get the show notes to this this interview um, and find out all about all the resources and, and links, please head on over to corpwarrior.com, C-O-R-P warrior.com. And that will redirect you to the homepage, which is 15-minute corporatewarrior.com and is far too long to remember um, and will shortly be replaced by Corp Warrior because it makes a lot more sense. Um, James, what's the best way for people to find out more about you these days? Send me an email. James.Fisher at solent.ac.uk. It's Fisher, F-I-S-H-E-R. Some people seem to want to put a C in there, but there's, there's no C. <laughs> I've noticed that. <laughs> Fred! <laughs> James, yeah, send, yeah, send me, yeah, just send me an email. I'm more than happy. I get, I get a bunch of emails, unsolicited emails from people who just have random questions about training or you know, my articles or you know, opinions on diet and things like that and I'm more than happy to chat with people so yeah ping me an email that's what I love about you James you're so accessible <laughs> <laughs> good stuff well look uh, I will let you go because I know you've got to get going but thank you so much I've really enjoyed this it. has been quite fun and more of a, a conversation than an interview um, and I much prefer this, this style it's quite different but um, yeah thank you very much for your time James I appreciate it no problem thanks a lot Lawrence have a great Christmas and New Year yeah you too take care speak to you soon bye take care bye bye This podcast is brought to you by hituni.com. That's H-I-T-U-N-I.com. HitUni is an e-learning course provider specializing in high-intensity training for personal trainers and for people looking to learn how to apply the principles of HIT to their own training for best results. It comes highly recommended by Body by Science author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, MedEx Precision Fitness owner Blair Wilson, HIT expert Drew Bay, and the founder of Living La Vida Low Carb, Jimmy Moore. It was founded by author and high-intensity training master personal trainer Simon Shawcross. Simon has 15 years experience and has supervised over 15,000 workouts. 
Due to a combination of demand and a lack of quality in certification programs in the fields of high intensity training, Simon and his team spent the last three years developing top quality courses that will educate fitness professionals and participants to enable them to train individuals and themselves in the safest manner and produce best results. Hit Uni has been put together using knowledge from the very best minds in the field of exercise, including Skylar Tanner, James Steele, Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, John Little, Mike Mensah, Arthur Jones, Dr. Ellington Darden, and many more. The courses are delivered online through the website, where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace and convenience. The online video presentations are engaging and make learning fun. Online support and a discussion forum are provided to resolve any sticking points and enable you to share ideas and ask for help. Depending on whether you want to become a personal trainer or already a personal trainer who wants to upskill, or if you're a keen HIT participant that is eager to learn more about how you can apply HIT to your own workouts for maximum benefit, there are several great value courses to choose from. I am personally partway through the PT course and I'm really enjoying it. I primarily wanted to do the course to learn more about how to apply HIT to my own training for better results. The courses are really easy to follow and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I.com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, H-I-T-Uni.com, pick your course and enter the coupon code CW10. Thanks very much for your support.